I would like to give the floor to uh, Professor uh, Rudolf Klein, who is a Professor of Architectural History at the Miklos Ibel Faculty of Architecture and Civil Engineering uh, here in Budapest at St. Istvan University. And Professor Klein is an old friend of CEU. He has already guided our uh, students through many synagogues in Hungary and even, uh, and even in Serbia which is his, uh, his native uh, country. Uh, he uh, has, uh, before coming to, uh, to Budapest, he has taught at the uh, University of Novi Sad, and then in, uh, in Israel at the Hebrew University at uh, the Bezalel Academy of Arts and uh, Design, Design, and at uh, Tel Aviv uh, University before in uh, 2005, coming to uh, St. Istvan University in, uh, in, in Budapest. Uh, Professor Klein is the author of a large uh, number of books, but the most I find splendid one, ones are the two that uh, we have here on the table and that after the lecture you can, uh, 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 you can see. Uh, the one is uh, called uh, Synagogues in Hungary, 1782 till 1918, published in 2017. And uh, the second, the, the second book is uh, a large uh, overview of, uh, as it is called, metropolitan Jewish uh, cemeteries, big urban cemeteries in uh, major uh, Jewish communities of uh, of Central Europe. To, mainly, and uh, Professor Klein is, has, has presently an exhibition uh, at the uh, Art uh, Exhibition Hall in Heroes uh, Square, uh, here in the 6th uh, district of, uh, of Budapest, with uh, his photos of uh, cemeteries. So, uh, without further ado, please, uh, we will listen to him speaking about uh, the synagogue and uh, emancipation architecture. Yeah. Uh, how can I make forward page up, page down? Okay, it works. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And apparently, um, my talk has nothing to do with the one of uh, Professor Garipur, but it's just the surface. If you go deeper, you will discover similarities in the behavior of Jews in the religious space in the, in the so-called uh, oriental world and the so-called occidental world, um, which is quite amazing. Um, where is the laser pointer? It's here. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. So my work was much easier than his. Um, basically, the synagogues that I'm going to present here were surveyed by others. All these uh, difficulties to getting in, well, I experienced them. Uh, but uh, the infrastructure, the monument preservation infrastructure here in, in Central Europe is, is pretty good. So uh, my work is more a summary than a pioneering uh, research, uh, surveying research into some uh, locations. Um, I will talk about the synagogues of Habsburg, Hungary, which means um, a larger territory than uh, Hungary comprises today. And it means also another cultural context. Uh, just let me... Officially, I am a doctor of technical sciences, but <laughs> practically I am clumsy. Um, which one is the pointer? There's a little red button on the top. Uh, above the, the arrows. Uh, there is... Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the context is um, the Habsburg monarchy, which was the second largest country in terms of territory on the European continent in the second half of the 19th century, and the third most populous uh, country in the same period. Uh, the country was uh, pretty inhomogeneous in terms of population, religion. It was really a, um, a sort of melting pot which didn't uh, work well enough to melt all these nationalities, so eventually the empire fell apart. Uh, but in the best period uh, that we in Hungary used to call the period between the Ausgleich, the Austro-Hungarian Compromise, and World War I, 
was uh, still a period when this melting pot um, did work and uh, there was an intersculptural interaction uh, between this uh, population. This is an ethnic map of the empire. Uh, Germans are the pink ones, Hungarians the greens, as a matter of fact. And um, Jews are scattered all around this territory. As for the um, political leadership, um, the emperor, who has the most beautiful wife in Europe, who got entertained by some uh, Hungarian Jewish intellectuals, as for instance uh, Maximilian Falk, um, the Kaiser turned a blind eye towards this um, not really um, entirely correct relationships um, because people thought that he loved the Jews. Uh, he didn't. Uh, he was nicknamed the Judenkaiser uh, because he was uh, relying on the Jews, but not because of love. He didn't like probably anyone save the beautiful wife, which was not um, um, reciprocitated at, at that time. Uh, but he was uh, smart enough to realize that he needed the Jews. The Jews were the infrastructure, the cement of this um, very um, uh, this homogeneous country, as Milan Kundera has this beautiful quotation as uh, published in the New Yorker some 20 years ago, that they were the intellectual and also economical cement beside the, the uh, bureaucracy of the empire, the German-speaking bureaucracy. Uh, Hungary. Hungary was in a, in a funny position. It was a kingdom inside uh, the empire, uh, which was a um, historical fact. And uh, inside Hungary, it was the liberal gentry who pushed the Jews to, to get assimilated. It's interesting that while we saw the little um, prayer halls in, 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 Pers in, in a Persian uh, location, and uh, the Jews were not spurred to make a bigger one. Here in Europe, it was the way around. When I mean, the first big synagogues appeared in Germany, in the Heidenreiter uh, Strasse or Gasse, I'm not sure, in Berlin, uh, it was the German and uh, the Prussian secret police, police who offered the Jews a big synagogue because in a big synagogue, Jews could be easier controlled because they were afraid of the Jews speaking a foreign language, foreign script, conspiracy, and so on and so forth. So basically, the big synagogue in Europe is not a Jewish initiative uh, at the first round, but it is uh, uh, pressure from, uh, from the Gentile environment. Later on, the Jews, uh, well, the Jewish families in Austria-Hungary, used it as a manifestation of their social success, um, but it is, it is quite different from um, the general situation. Okay. Now, uh, what was the general consensus about the Jews? Um, uh, it is Ferenc Deak, who was the mm, sage of the Hungarian nation, who likened Jews um, to the salt, of which you need a pinch of uh, it in all your meat meals, but too much spoils the food. So this is this ambivalence towards the Jews. On the one hand, they are needed, you know, to make the, the food tasty. On the other hand, it's too much, then, then it's dangerous. And this politically incorrect um, statement actually, actually describes quite well um, the Gentile attitude vis-a-vis -vis the Jews in the second half of the 19th century, in the first half of the 20th. Um, then, uh, around 1900, when the Jewish community of Hungary numbered more than a million people, uh, that was roughly 5% of the general population, and this percentage went up to 23.6 in Budapest. So practically every fourth citizen of uh, uh, the capital city was Jewish. Uh, not counting um, um, mixed marriages and baptized Jews, so it might have gone up to uh, even uh, 30%. In this period, Jews were culturally so present, present that uh, many Christians voiced um, a fear that um, this salt is too much. Yeah? So the, the Hungarian Jews are uh, turning the Hungarian society into something Jewish-like. Now this... Um, idea of Jewish-like and Jewish vis-a-vis -vis Gentile and Christian was already debated in the mid-19th uh, century in Germany by Karl Schnase, who was the leading art historian of the 19th century, producing an um, art history encyclopedia of some 12 volumes, even in the, in the age of internet, something um, to be um, um, appreciated. And he discovered some principles of the Jewish attitude Jewish religion vis-a-vis -vis architecture, 
Jews and Arabs, so the Oriental world, in a, in a Western terminology, I don't like the, the term Oriental, but in a Western way of um, um, viewing it, um, these are uh, people who are believing in an abstract God. These are people who are missing the link between form and spirit. And, and so th these are problematic and they are producing, from a, a Christian point of view, um, a second class uh, architecture. And the second class status of architecture is really a hallmark of, of synagogues that are uh, not expressing ideas, that are just pragmatic, practical building. Where, where you build a synagogue, you have a Bimai and you have an Aron, and the rest is just taken from the environment. Of course, the Bible has some uh, talks about, um, about architecture, but it's a negative issue. It is the Tower of Babel, uh, when people started to, to compete with God, and the whole uh, project ended up in, in, in a disaster. And it's interesting how the Tower of Babel um, goes uh, through Western architecture, not only Jewish, it is the Sanibala Sapienza in Rome. Uh, this is a representation of, of Doré. And this is the third international of the communist Russia that, that uses uh, the same uh, symbol. And it goes on with Zvi Hecker and goes on with Peter Eisenman with the Max Reinhardt House in, in Berlin. So if you take any period, uh, you will see that there is no continuity a historic continuity in architectural terms in synagogue architecture. This is an antique uh, synagogue in, in Israel. This is the Worms synagogue. This is the Prague synagogue. This is the synagogue in, 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 um, in Lviv, in Shofka, in the outskirts of Lviv. And there is little uh, continuity. Now, this, continu this lack of a formal continuity is due to the image ban or image reluctance of the Jews and concentration on the text which is actually the same story seen from another uh, uh, point of view. In any case, they are um, borrowing architectural language from the neighborhood. This is the Prague Synagogue, and this is a city hall in a, in a Slovakian um, town, Gothic period, Gothic period, of course. And it goes on like that, that it is a permanent uh, borrowing. And this brought us to the idea uh, that art historians very eager to, to emphasize there is no such thing as synagogue architecture uh, because it is always changing, it, it has no continuity, so there is actually nothing to study. Um, and you can have some case studies, but it's not going to make up a big hole. And uh, this was intriguing me from my uh, early days as an architectural historian to find some uncommon ground, how this amorphous uh, facet of art, the genre, came into being, and what is the common denominator uh, between these um, uh, distinct buildings. And this led me to uh, develop a system, a methodology, how to make a typology of synagogues in a certain period and, and certain place, which will describe this variety. So uh, synagogue architecture is much less amorphous then it, 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 it shows at the first glance, this is Worms, um, almost exactly like Prague 200 years later. So <clears throat> there is some continuity, but the continuity is more on the level of space due to the ritual and less on the level of architectural language. So space might be considered, if you take these examples from, from Persia, uh, some of them were quite similar to uh, the counterparts in the early modern uh, world in, in Europe. So uh, while it's really far uh, in terms of space, metaphysics of space, the idea of having two centers, two focal points of the interior, which is fundamental for the Jewish place of worship. Jews are not looking at one direction. They are the, the culture that sees from different angles. So in certain periods of the, the service, they are facing the bima. In certain periods of, uh, of the, the service, they are facing the Aron. So it is this changing viewpoints, changing aspects um, that characterizes, uh, and it is, it is also the Jewish jokes, by the way. So there is a common Jewish attitude which goes from the joke to philosophy, of religion, of, of responsa, rabbinic responsa, and it goes down to, to architectural uh, details. And this is actually the beginning of my research period, um, 18th century. A first example that 
bear some similarity to the Persian examples that is not showing up on the street. Uh, this is a synagogue in Arad, uh, early um, 19th century, where the Jews were um, afraid. First of all, they got a permission from the Kaiser, from the emperor, to construct a synagogue. But what they constructed during the day was torn down by the Gentiles during the night. So they came to the conclusion that they should build a building which looks, an apart looks like an apartment block, and inside you have a genuine uh, synagogue space which is absolutely uh, paradigmatic. You have uh, the Bima, you have the Aron, you have the Ezrat Nashim. Also, Ezrat Nashim is a notion that you heard. It was a bit differently spelled in, in Persian, but it is uh, roughly the same, uh, the Hebrew uh, notion. Here you have uh, the view towards the ceiling. Then another example of the hidden synagogue, uh, it is still before uh, Jewish emancipation, the Stadttempel in Vienna which is also 1820s, which is behind an apartment block, an elliptical space, which is curiously enough uh, a Catholic elliptical space. So the Jews are taking over the, the ellipsis, which is a, a counter-reformation form from the 16th century, 17th century uh, Europe, that uh, entered the synagogue space. The first real synagogue expression in uh, Austria-Hungary, it is an example from Bucharest, but it is a replacement from the Stadttempel in Vienna that was destroyed by the Nazis, which uses Oriental uh, architectural language because this Oriental refers to the Oriental uh, identity of the Jews that are, in the certain periods of the 19th century, considered as the Orientals of the West. And this uh, style, Oriental style, which is completely, I mean, artificial, it has nothing to do with the real Orient, it is a compilation of Owen Jones, Robert Owen Jones, the English, the British gentleman who went to study uh, the Alhambra and Islamic architectural language, and the architects in Europe started to copy from his copybook. I mean, uh, no architect had the patient time and money in the 19th century to visit the Orient. So the Oriental style became a, a mock style, uh, which was somehow uh, commensurate with the, with the social and cultural uh, standing of Jews um, in the period uh, society. In terms of interior, this is a Catholic church. It changed the central synagogue interior, and you have a long, long, like a Via Sacra in a Catholic church, that culminates in the altar, and uh, you have also the organ. The organ is showing up in the 1860s, 50s, 60s, uh, second half of the 19th century. And the last wave is, again, return to the central plan. This is the synagogue Subotica, which was recently restored. Um, this is the situation before restoration. And this is an example of mid-interwar uh, uh, period synagogues that are also going back to some Orientalism, particularly the architecture of uh, the Holy Land uh, in the mandate, mandate uh, period under the British uh, uh, crown. So this was a general introduction. And uh, now I would like to show you the Jewish mm, pattern of migration, which is a very important factor in terms of synagogue architecture, because unlike the Christian church, churches, which are basically hierarchy organized, particularly the Catholic church, um, the Jewish communities are all independent. They do have an umbrella organization, but they can listen, but they need not listen. So uh, this is the situation that in one city you have completely diverse synagogues. This is this uh, issue in Persia that you have a complex of three buildings that are different in terms of right, that are different in, in terms of service. And there are many examples in other places. In Jerusalem you have the five Sephardi synagogues, which is a similar complex. Then you had late medieval uh, complex in Frankfurt and Erfurt. So there were synagogues with, with uh, these multiple options of, of um, having um, uh, different communities inside the community as an umbrella. Now, this is a short architectural history of the 19th century synagogue architecture, starting with the late Baroque. Actually, the 19th century, if we speak about the long 19th century, it means that 19th century starts with the uh, French Revolution and ends with World War I, and it is really um, can be substantiated in architectural terms. You have the central plan, which is the traditional synagogue. Wherever you turn, synagogues will have a central plan, and this is in the Islamic world, it is in the Buddhist world, 
wherever you turn, this is the traditional synagogue arrangement. Under the influence of Christianity, particularly in Austria-Hungary, which was an officially Catholic country, despite the Protestant minorities, the synagogue changes the interior and uh, becomes uh, longitudinal, like the Dohain. Um, and then there is a return uh, to the central uh, space, but it is already a, a revival. In terms of architectural styles, it could be observed that there is a slight delay. So this is the mainstream, the church architecture, Baroque, neoclassical, which ends early in churches. And then you have a relatively long Romantic period, which uh, ends up in the freestyle, and you have Art Nouveau. Um, there is a difference in the periods of, of uh, Catholic churches and synagogues. Synagogues are a bit late. Neoclassicism lasts longer, Romanticism lasts longer, and freestyle goes uh, uh, into the 20th century. Now, if you make a cross-section through the Hungarian kingdom, um, in early 19th century and uh, early 20th century, you see that you have different types of synagogues which um, corroborates with the immigration. So these are the first immigrants from the religious enclaves, religious regions, uh, Galicia, Bukovina, and later in the early 20th century, these are already assimilated Jews who uh, sp have spread over uh, the whole kingdom. So first you have a, a Jewish uh, heavily Jewish settled areas, and you have Transylvania, which is practically Judenfrei, uh, most of the 19th century um, Hungary. Now, uh, my biggest contribution to synagogue research was that I stopped the traditional type typology based on style. Because this is from the beginning problematic. Synagogue doesn't have a real style, it is borrowing the style. And the question of definition of style is styling also taking uh, space into consideration, or style is just the surface. So to, in order to settle all these problems, I invented a, a mathematical method, as I have my first degree in engineering, that you have a matrix, uh, composition of volumes from the outside. You have the plan. You have the architectural language, or style, if you like, in the interior, exterior. You have the material of the walls. You have the size of the synagogue, and you have the location, location inside the block, and location inside the city. And then this is like if you go to the Trofea, this buffet, you probably know this restaurant uh, network in Budapest, that you can take a bit of tartar bistec, you can take a bit of sushi. Now, uh, this type of, of eating characterizes synagogue architecture from practically the early 19th century. So you have um, cherry picking. You like this facade, aha, you take it. You like this plan, nice. You like this interior language. You like this exterior language. You can take your size, whatever you want. It could be the same size, same type, small and big. And then uh, it's really a type of buffet uh, uh, eating, a buffet meal vis-a-vis -vis the menu. When you have a neo-Gothic church with all the neo-Gothic elements, neo-Gothic space, neo-Gothic arches, neo-Gothic materials. So, um, and this suits very much the Jews, who are all the time in the, this last couple of thousand years cherry picking. You know, it's 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 very much a multifaceted eclectical culture, which founds its outlet in this uh, 19th and early 20th century series. And then I discovered uh, the most important element is how they show up to the Gentiles, because the 19th century is about showing Jewish identity, showing Jewish present, uh, landmarking. Jewish existence in a certain urban settlement. Uh, the first type was the type of um, burger's house. This is a synagogue in Tokai, which is extremely famous. All the Haridim are going there, you know, spending a lot of money. It's, it's quite an industry. Um, and it looks like a burger's house. Then the next step is really enlightenment. Enlightenment, uh, neoclassicism, the, the spirit of uh, Greek, Roman, and Renaissance enlightenment, which takes the pediment, which takes the, the Greek uh, columns. <clears throat> and then you have a type of the uh, Jews in the villages. This is a, a type of synagogue that is difficult to research. I got some data from the archives, but they are practically non-existent because Jews left the villages. 
First of all, during the Holocaust, Hungarian Jews were mainly collected from the villages. Jews survived mainly in the capital city and in the forced labor camps. So uh, the Jewish village life completely disappeared. So this is a problem how to research it. Nevertheless, from archival sources, I collected some 200 synagogues, which I call synagogues of peasant house type. And this is the burger house. There are types. So this is the interesting thing that in Austria-Hungary, you have distinct types in terms of uh, exterior, in terms of plan. The problem is that they are not corroborating. So you can have a, a, a floor plan type B and you can have an exterior type A and you can have, have the way around. So uh, this idea that you have a, a general notion, you have the idea an eidos, and you have, which is an idea in the form and the same, is absent in the Jewish, uh, Jewish architectural tradition. So this is this free uh, cherry picking. And this goes so far that it is the rabbi who decides. So you don't have a scripture that you read and you know, aha, it should be there, this should be there, the proportion, nothing. This is the rabbi and the mason who decide, and the rabbi wants to have a central bima. And when he passes away, then comes another rabbi, destroys the bima in the center, puts a, a bima in front of the aron, which is an element of emancipation. And then comes a third rabbi, who says, no, 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 it's, it's, it's goish. Let's put the bima in the middle of the space. So it's so, so very individual. This is this famous synagogue in Mad, which it looks pretty plasticky. It was restored, you know out of nothing, and a lot of it is really plastic. Uh, this is the synagogue in Bonyad, which uh, is not threatened by any restoration. So if you would like to see a genuine late Baroque synagogue, go to Bonyad. Um, this is Tupava in, um, in Slovakia, not far from Bratislava, which is the same four-column type, which has its mystical uh, roots back into to the Bible and, um, and the Kabbalah. This is Hust, or Kust, there is, uh, which is the last four-column synagogue, uh, interior in Kust. And this is Albert Irsha, still this type from the outside, the burger house, but the interior you see is uh, quite different. And then this type has, uh, I collected some 300 of, of uh, uh, this uh, synagogue in Hungary. This is the Enlightenment, uh, Obuda. We are going to publish soon a book about this synagogue in some two months' time which will be bilingual, Hungarian and English. This is the interior, which made is completely of plastic because it was a TV studio during the communist time and destroyed the interior. But the rabbi was intelligent enough to listen to the architects and the restoration is pretty uh, successful. This shows the <clears throat> way how this type came into being. Um, Jews of the Obda community were fascinated by the Lutheran church in the center of Pest. This is this Lutheran church on the Achter. And they ordered the architect. They wanted to hire the same architect, but he, he was too expensive. So they found another architect who was a beginner and told him, let's make a copy of this Protestant church. And uh, this copy was done. So they had to change the central bima to a western bima. And slowly, slowly, uh, the early um, uh, synagogue in uh, Obuda, which had four columns, were rebuilt this Ezrat Nashim edit, and the uh, ceiling changed. It was a nine-way arrangement. It was changed to a barrel vault. This is the barrel vault. So it became a, a Protestant church. And this is a similar type in Bayo. This is probably the most exciting synagogue in the former Hungarian kingdom in Liptovsky Sviaty Mikulash, which became Liptovsky Mikulash in the communist period. They dropped the Sviaty, um, uh, which was uh, first, sorry, um, a neoclassical building, probably with uh, four central columns. Then it was set on fire. Uh, Anti-Semitism is a nice tradition of this, uh, this county. And then they built an Oriental-style synagogue, but retained the exterior. So the exterior neoclassical shell remained, and they changed the interior three times. Uh, there was a second arson attack uh, at, uh, uh, in 1905, after which it became a Lar Nouveau and the architect was uh, Leopold Baumhorn. And it shows the versions how architecture uh, changed. And then this type goes on. Now this is the first type of emancipation, the Catholic interior, which I uh, call the, the Jerusalem temple type because the facade looks that, like the Jerusalem temple, but the interior is a Catholic church. 
And this is already emancipation when they start to find a common denominator uh, between the uh, Christianity. Christianity and uh, baptism in 19th century Jewish tradition is not apostasy. It is joining the world religion, which makes a difference. Uh, so they want to abandon the particularity in order to become the avant-garde of a certain period. And this is uh, the explanation that so many uh, prominent Jewish families have left Judaism, including the family of, of Moses Mendelssohn, who is the father of Haskalah. His children were already baptized. So it is a completely different view as after the Holocaust. After the Holocaust, we are the victims of Christianity. Sorry. Um, so this is uh, uh, Israeli discourse and which justifies uh, the new modern uh, Jewish state and this changes, of course, the consciousness of Jews and all these uh, political discourses around it. Uh, this is still the same type from the outside and this is the interior, one of the most beautiful synagogues in the Habsburg Empire, built by Ludwig Förster, who built the Dohain and the Tempelgasse um, in Mishkolz. And then goes this type. Uh, the next type is for Orthodox Jews. The Orthodox Jews wanted to, to avoid any hint to Christianity, the dome, the towers, and they wanted to have something that looks like a, a factory hall, that looks like a, a chapel, but, um, and often they use the minaret. So it is, again, an interesting mix of uh, some modern templates, the industrial hall, but to make it sacred, they put uh, the, the minarets. Uh, which is a, a proposition of Jews at the Orientals of the Europe, but uh, assimilated Jews at that period already abandoned the minaret, or abandoned Orientalism, because they are not Orientals of Europe. They are Hungarian-speaking Jews. They are Hungarians of Jewish faith. So this Orientalism then remains with the Orthodox, who are in a delay of 20 years in terms of attitude, um, in terms of clothing, uh, in terms of folklore, and in terms of architecture. And these are these orthodox uh, synagogues of factory type. And then the coronation are two types, the Catholic church type and the Byzantine church type. This is the Dohain. It's really the breakthrough synagogue in, in Europe. Um, it precedes the Oranienburger Straße, some 12 years. So this is the first big Jewish temple with 3,000 seats, um, which is a mix of the Frauenkirche in Munich, which is the biggest medieval church in, in Europe, and a hypothetic synagogue project of the 1840s um, from the German um, competitions to find the ideal synagogue plan. And then these two towers, actually um, the community didn't want to have it. The community wanted to have a dome, to have a very pompous solution, but first there was um, reluctant to make a new project, so he doubled his project from Vienna, which is only one year older, and added two towers and said, be happy with it. And then this two-tower Catholic solution spread over Austria-Hungary, mainly in the Hungarian kingdom, but you have it in Vienna, you have it in Prague, and uh, this is the interior, which is a real Catholic interior, long with the organ, with the choir, and this is the typology. Now the last type is the Byzantine church with a historic misunderstanding of Solomon's temple. When the first uh, um, uh, crusaders came here, they have mistaken, some of them have mistaken, uh, the Dome of the Rock for Solomon's temple. And then Som Solomon's temple shows up in the Renaissance painting and shows up consequently in uh, synagogue architecture of the 19th century, which also relies on Byzantine churches. Here is the Gracianica, which is more or less copied by the same uh, uh, quite prominent Renaissance artists like, uh, um, like Leonardo himself. And then a Jewish identity, which tries to find a plan. If the church has a cross plan, you started uh, um, experimenting with the hexagon, the hexagonal plan, and there are some synagogues with the hexagonal plan, which is quite uh, controversial, and the octagonal plan, which is, interestingly, uh, in Persia, and which is also parallel in Europe. So this is the Byzantine church type, a central big dome, and four smaller ones. The first one in Dior, 1868. Uh, it is Dior. Dior interior. It's now a music academy, 
and the gallery here you have modern Jewish artists like Moholy Nagy, Kashak, um, um, Kashak was not Jewish, but Kashak's uh, students, Orsag Lili, and some others, and you have concerts also. And this is this type spread all over uh, the empire, and this type shows up also in Germany later, in the proto-modern period. This is Szeged. Uh, Szeged is the most pompous Art Nouveau synagogue, which is actually not Art Nouveau in terms of style, but in terms of spirit. And the real Art Nouveau synagogue in Subotica, which has these Hungarian motives. Um, the Jews in the um, areas inhabited by, by minorities tended to be more Hungarians than the Hungarian. So uh, they were actually playing the role of Hungarians among Serbs, Croats, Romanians, whatever, Ruthenians, they were the, the Hungarians. And uh, this is the reason that they use the Hungarian folklore. And of course, a modern structure, it's a shell structure in 1902, which is absolutely extraordinary. And then it goes into the modern period with reinforced concrete, as is the synagogue in uh, Trenčín. And then this is the catalog of this time. Uh, I still have, I guess, some five, six minutes. And I will talk about the urban aspect, which was quite fascinating in the, in the <coughs> uh, Persian um, examples. Synagogue in the, in the city. Um, before emancipation, Jews inhabited the outskirts in terms of uh, urban location. And the synagogue was in the middle of the plot. It was not allowed to show up on the street. This restriction lasted officially until 1840, but even after that, Jews liked to have a, a fence in front of the synagogue. And it ended up in Kachkamet, where the synagogue shares a prominent uh, place on the main square with the Catholic Church, Protestant Church, um, two Protestant churches actually, Calvinist and, and, and the Lutheran, and the city hall. So this is really a parliamentary democracy uh, in, the, in the late uh, Habsburg period. Now, a uh, medieval situation is very similar to what we have in the Islamic world, the hidden synagogue, which goes below the surf uh, surface of the earth. But this goes on the early modern period as well. Now, it is an early 19th century um, plan of Kachkamit, uh, which is the most Hungarian um, place probably in the central area of Hungary, uh, with these uh, dry mills. It, this is a huge village. This is the so-called Pannonian uh, town, which is a um, market town. It's translated to Akastat in German. It's difficult to translate because it's basically a Hungarian phenomenon. And you have the Jewish block, uh, the flat of the rabbi, of the, of the teacher, Jewish uh, hospital, uh, one synagogue, another synagogue. And the first big synagogue appeared in the middle of the block. However, an earthquake came early 20th century, I guess, 1906. Uh, after which there was an urban clearance and they demolished this old house in front of the synagogue. So the synagogue stepped on the main square, unprecedented. Yeah? And then uh, they had to make some cosmetics to restore the size of the synagogue that were not for the public. So um, Baumhorn, the famous uh, synagogue architect, uh, made this facade to somehow fit into this Jewish street that uh, would have led to the railway station but the railway company cheated the Jews and didn't replace the, uh, the station here that they could sell the merchandise on this avenue. It remained on the old place. It's another interesting story uh, how this early industrialization impacts uh, Jewish life and synagogue architecture. Now you have um, uh, northern Hungary, which is today Slovakia. Sorry, I didn't want to be political. Uh, this is the double bicentric uh, uh, Pressburg. Um, I use um, intentionally the politically neutral Pressburg term. Uh, you have the oops, you have the Burger City, and you have the feudal castle, and you Jews are protected by the feudals, so they are in this uh, place between, and uh, Jews are usually between, and this between is that they are uh, enjoying the protection and they are serving the city, the market. This is the business. And the synagogue is so big that it hides part of the cathedral of St. Martin. Uh, then the synagogue was, of course, during the Nazi period, was demolished. And this is Kosice, another northern uh, Hungarian or Slovak uh, uh, example with the one center. 
Jews were not allowed to the very center of the town. Then there it is the first wall, the medieval wall. Then you have an early modern wall, and the Jews were admitted to this uh, area between the first wall and the second wall. And you have a set of synagogues here. Um, and this is a fortunate case. This is Subotica, where you have five nationalities and five religions, and the Jews are now in, in almost equal footing with the others, inhabiting coming from the north as a wedge, sorry for this metaphor, and then through this wedge they arrive to the center, uh, created first um, the synagogue and second the city hall. Uh, this is my study of uh, plot ownership in the center of the town. Reds are Catholics, uh, blues are Greek Orthodox, blacks are public buildings, and yellow are the Jews. Usually if you make such a study of uh, plots, you will discover that you, Jews have a special settling um, pattern that, uh, first of all, they look for plots on the corner. Then the next Jew would buy a plot that he can communicate with this neighbor on the, on the corner. And then you have a complete network. Uh, this. I'm sorry for this formulation, it was politically highly incorrect, but it works like that. And in the same period, you have Jewish presence. So this is conservative Catholic majority of Subotica. These are Hungarian Catholics. These are Orthodox Serbs, and this is the synagogue. Oradea. Oradea was one of the most Jewish uh, cities in the empire. Uh, almost 30% of uh, the population was Jewish. Most of them were traditional Jews. Blue color uh, depicts, this is a common research of me and Frederick Bedoir, who is a doyen of uh, the topic Jews and modernity. And uh, the brown color is Jewish owner and Art Nouveau. That is a very attract, big attraction of Jews uh, towards Art Nouveau. And I wrote a couple of papers about it. I will give my email and you can read my, my papers. The synagogue has an absolutely, sorry, dominant position. This is a cathedral here on the riverside. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, this was it, and I'm open to, to your questions. Uh, my time uh, expired, and you are encouraged to raise questions. <laughs>